Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live from New York City, Midtown Manhattan with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus. Always good to be here in my hometown, my native turf in New York, but more importantly, no matter where we are, to be in Christ. He's coming and he will establish a new kingdom. So let us look at this week in prophecy with that in view. As we anticipated, not much really happened other than a spectacular view from certain locations of the eclipse that took place this past week in prophecy. It was made a big deal of, including rabbinic predictions, because it happened on Tisha B'Av. Well, predictably, there was nothing catastrophic or unique about it, as we said there most likely would not be although it was interesting, it took place on Tisha B'Av. Eclipses are not a typical biblical phenomena as an astral sign of anything prophetic, and nothing of any particular significance transpired. Again, this is my concern. Much like the blood moon hoax, like this other nonsense coming on September 23rd, and the eclipse, which at least had a grain of, of plausibility in that it was on Tisha B'Av. When something major happens, and there is a sign in the heavenlies, the boy that cried wolf syndrome will kick in. Satan knows this. He raises up these crackpots to make big deals out of things that are nothing, that have no validity, no basis in scripture, no real substance. He'll raise up a crackpot like Mark Biltz or somebody to begin saying these ridiculous things. Now, those people will profit from those things, but when the things happen, they fail to happen. So when something really does happen, people will just think it's these crazy so-called believers again saying crazy things. This is all a setup by Satan. We should not speak so irresponsibly of these things. We need to be really, really careful when we say something is of prophetic significance. Let's talk about the ordeal of Joseph in the book of Genesis. He was sent to prison for a sex crime he did not commit based on the false accusation of a wicked woman. Now, we've explained before Joseph is a type of Christ, and there are tremendous typological significances and aspects of the epic of Joseph that foreshadow things of the last days. This past week in Great Britain, a lesbian named Gemma Beale, who supposedly liked to be a victim in the eyes of other lesbian women, made a series of accusations of sexual assault and rape against men. One of these men, based only on her evidence and the persuasion of a jury, was sent to prison. Well, it's been found she was a complete fraud. This took place because of the Criminal Justice Act in Great Britain of 1994, where corroborative evidence was not necessary to obtain a conviction and a rape allegation. It just became the word of the victim or the claimed victim against the word of the accused. Jury decides no corroborative evidence. Now, this, of course, is a complete, complete corruption of jurisprudence. Forget about innocent or proven guilty. Hillary Clinton, of course, wanted to introduce this to the United States. She said a woman's right to be believed. Because she's a woman who makes an accusation, she has a right to be believed. Well, this woman, Gemma Beale, lied and was found to be a liar and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The judge was particularly angry because at least one innocent man 
went to prison because of her. But the judge said this is going to cause guilty rapists to go free. This case will be cited by defense attorneys trying to spring actual sex criminals from prison, and it will work in their favor because of the judicial precedent set by it. It would also deter other women from coming forward who have been the actual victims of rape. It hurts women. Now, this lesbian, Gemma Beale, could not have cared less. Thank God she was caught. Thank God she sent to prison. And thank God the innocent man was removed from prison. But this just shows you the direction that radical feminism is going and radical homosexuality and lesbianism is going. Again, fueled by corrupt politicians like Hillary Clinton, a woman has a right to be believed. What about innocent until proven guilty? The consequences of this are going to be actual sex criminals, men who actually perpetrate these ugly crimes going free. But it's only about politics. It's not about justice. And so it happened. The sin that accused Joseph falsely. This is coming back. It's making headway politically. It's something that needs to be stopped. Now, people who are innocent will be targeted by this. I can easily envision cases where there will be setups of Christian pastors or Christian preachers or Christian authors where they will be set up we need to be very, very careful. These people are treacherous. Some of them are demonized. They'll stop at nothing. Just think of the story of Joseph. Thank God this one injustice was corrected. I hope this lesbian, Gemma Beale, repents and gets saved, but that is not very likely to happen based on Romans chapter 1. Let's move on. The Israel Gala, commemorating the Munich massacres of the Israeli Olympic team in the 1970s, has relocated its gala observance this year to President Trump's secular business establishment, Ma'alago in Florida. They did it because they want to show support for President Trump as a Jewish and that is pro-Israeli organization thanking President Trump for not going the way of Barack Obama, who was an enemy of Israel, in all of his actions with Iran, and all of his actions with the UN, Barack Obama was an enemy of Israel. To show support for President Trump, the gala will be held at Mar-a-Lago. I only wish American Jews would listen to Alan Dershowitz. He will go down in history, President Obama, as one of the worst foreign policy presidents ever. He called me into the Oval Office before the election and he said to me, Alan, I want your support and I have to tell you, I will always have Israel's back. I didn't realize what he meant is that he would have his back to stab them in the back. Mm. And what he did was so nasty, he pulled a bait and switch. He said to the American public, oh, this is all about the settlements mm -hmm. deep in the West Bank. And yet he allowed his representative to the U.N. to abstain, which is really right. for a resolution that says the Jews can't pray at the Western Wall. Right. Jews can't live in the Jewish quarter where they've lived for thousands of years. And he's going to say, whoops, I didn't mean that. Well, read the resolution. You're a lawyer. You went to Harvard Law School. Admit it. He was naive and foolish, gullible in supporting Barack Obama and believing Barack Obama when Barack Obama said he had Israel's back. To quote Mr. Dershowitz, he put a knife in Israel's back. That's how he had Israel's back. The foolishness and naivety of American Jews. I also wish American Jews would listen more to Israelis. Stop being so foolish. Stop being misled by traitors to the Jewish people. Stop following people like Debbie Washerman Schultz and these other left-wing Jews who've led you astray up the garden path. Remember Linda Sasser, a so-called feminist, 
who was a believer in Sharia, she is a radical Muslim, said, you cannot be a feminist and a Zionist. You hear that, left-wing, progressive, liberal, Jewish American women? Linda Sarsour is a Muslim political activist who co-chaired the Women's March in Washington this past January. In an interview with The Nation magazine, she said a person cannot support Israel and be a feminist because, quote, you either stand up for the rights of all women, including Palestinians, or none. Well, that has several pro-Israel feminists irate. Big Bang Theory star a Mayim Bilek, if indeed that's her name, said Wednesday that, quote, the left needs to re-examine the microscope they used to look at Israel, for sure. Comedian Roseanne Barr tweeted this, is it even possible to be a pro-Palestinian feminist? Sarsour isn't selective in her wrath, by the way. In January, she said that ex-Muslim feminist Ayan Hirsch, uh, Hirsi Ali should have her genitalia taken away from her for criticizing Islam. Notably, Ali is herself a victim of female genital mutilation. You couldn't make that up. It's too horrible. Well, that's it for us tonight. You're probably not hearing. Wake up. Your self-destructive idiocy is going to catch up with you. This week in prophecy, we are seeing a dichotomy increasingly between the Israeli Jewish community and much of the diasporic, especially American. This is going to continue. On August 22nd, the police located a young 16-year-old woman in Pakistan named Samira. She was kidnapped. She was forcibly raped and forced to marry one of the men who abducted her, forced into a marriage of a man who abducted her and raped her. And then, as a Christian, forcibly converted to Islam. This has become quite common. Approximately 700 underage Christian girls a year in Pakistan alone that are known, that are documented cases. One province in Pakistan where this has happened particularly, uh, amended its laws with the view of trying to somehow curtail it. This was in the Sindh province where forced conversions of Islam would not be legally recognized. But the Pakistan Council on Islamic Ideology objected. And so <clears throat> this province and its provincial government is reconsidering the law. Can you imagine an Islamic religious authority the Council on Islamic Ideology objects to a law that says a forced conversion is illegitimate. You kidnap, criminally abduct an underage girl, gang rape her, force her into a marriage with a man she doesn't even know, forcibly convert her to Islam, and that must legally stand in what is misrepresented by the media as a religion of peace and tolerance. Again, it is not. Are there moderate Muslims? Yes. Is there moderate Islam? Show me where it exists. This week in prophecy, interesting things began to happen. In Pakistan, a Christian <clears throat> who was completely innocent <coughs> died in prison in Lahore. Following the Islamic attack on two churches in Lahore, in which 22 Christians were killed and 85 injured, mostly seriously, the police came and began arresting Christians because they were defending themselves following these Islamic attacks. There was no evidence of film footage that would have implicated Mr. Andreas Gulan. Nonetheless, the police in the general roundup arrested him and put him in prison where he's died. You blow up a church, you murder Christians, and then the Christians get arrested. This is so typical of Islamic barbarism. A young girl is abducted and raped. A Muslim girl. But unless there are four male witnesses, <laughs> she's found guilty. There was a 15-year-old, a case of at least one case that was well-documented of a 15-year-old 
Muslim girl in Pakistan who was raped and impregnated. And she was ordered flogged by an Islamic judicial Sharia committee of the village elders because there were not four male witnesses to say she was raped. She, she was flogged. This is what they do to underage girls, Muslim girls. What will they do to Christians? This is a demonic religious ideology. Fundamentalist Islam is nothing short of demonic. It is anti-Semitic. It is anti-Judeo-Christian. It is anti-human rights. But we are fed the lie that it has to be tolerated. How can you tolerate the intolerance? Now, again, I am not saying all Muslims support this. There are a minority of the world's Muslims, a minority of the world's Muslims who are moderate, who do not agree with these things. But if there's moderate Islam, I'd like to know where it is. I've gone from Morocco to Brunei. I've been in Malaysia. I've been in Saudi Arabia. I've been in the Persian Gulf. I've been in many Muslim countries in the Middle East and elsewhere, into Asia, from North Africa, all the way across the spectrum from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And I've not found one single Islamic country that is moderate and tolerant that will give Christians and Jews the human rights and the religious freedom that Muslims are given in Western countries. Please show me one. But of course, the mainstream media can't, the left-wing academics can't. And so the game is played. Let's continue. This week in Prophecy, a very interesting interview by Charlie Rose with the Abu Dhabi Emirates Ambassador to the United States, Yosef al Otiiba. He claimed in the interview that the Islamic nations in the Gulf opposing Qatar, including Saudi Arabia, are desiring to have a moderate, more secularized government. This triggered immediate reactions from the House of Saud. Princess Fada ben Saud accused him of trying to undermine Islam and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia by saying this. This proves that although there are moderate Muslims who do want to have a secularized government that is tolerant of all religions and ideologies and views that they want to modernize, this kind of tolerance cannot be allowed. There will be too much of a fundamentalist reaction to it. And of course, whoever has the most petrol dollars will win. This is the reality. And it's reality that the American government, the British government and Western governments are well aware of. Saudi Arabia is as bad as Iran. The Wahhab, the Salafists, the House of Saud are as wicked and as responsible for terror as are the Iranian mullahs. Shia, Sunni, it doesn't matter. They serve the same Lord, and it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's simply in the political economic interests of Russia to side with Iran, at least as they perceive it, or of America and Britain to side with Saudi Arabia, at least as they perceive it. But one is no better than the other. Yet this week in prophecy, the interview happened, demonstrating that it's impossible for these Gulf states to in any sense modernize and become more tolerant to depart from radical interpretations of Sharia. It's not going to happen, not going to happen. Quite a situation this week in prophecy. Benjamin Netanyahu had a meeting with Vladimir Putin, and quite a meeting it was. The subject, of course, was Iran. 
the Israelis spelled out directly the Iranian objective to gain controls via the Shia population of Iraq into Syria and then into Lebanon. The Israelis have already launched missile attacks on shipments of weapons through Syria bound for Hezbollah in Lebanon, originating in Iran. Mr. Netanyahu made his appeal to Mr. Putin. They had their photo op, their Kodak moment, etc. But nothing firm has happened. Or will happen. Again, do not be surprised if a Gog and Magog scenario eventually takes place a la Ezekiel 38 and 39. Be that as it may, Mr. Netanyahu told Mr. Putin something that we've been saying for years. It is not in Russia's interest long term. The mullahs, the mullahs of Iran and of Shia Islam are natural bedfellows for the secessionist Islamic communities inside of Russia, including Chechnya. Once they use Russia to obtain their own objectives in the Middle East and against Israel, they will obviously target Russia. Russia is like Japan. It has an aging population, a geriatric time bomb with a low birth rate. The exception being the growing Islamic population inside of Russia. It is not likely that Mr. Putin will listen to reason. Mr. Netanyahu was quite reasonable and quite accurate in what he stated this week in prophecy. The reason he will not listen, if there is to be a Gog and Magog scenario, is this. God has said, I will put hooks in your jaws and pull you in to your destruction by aligning itself and being supportive of Israel's enemies and by enacting new laws that restrict evangelism, missions, the freedom of churches to preach the gospel simply because Mr. Putin sees only the Russian Orthodox Church as valid for political reasons because of its being synonymous with Russian nationalism, the anti-evangelicism that is in his regime is at odds with the cause of the gospel. This is something that David Wilkerson said would happen. Before the Iron Curtain came down, he said Russia will open for a season and then it will close again. Well, thus far, David Wilkerson's prophetic prediction has been precisely right. Times Square Church is not quite what it was under David Wilkerson. The teaching then was certainly right. Now it has become rather flimsy, to tell you the truth. I don't say heretical, but it is not what it was. It has deteriorated spiritually and doctrinally. But when he was around, he was someone who God was using to warn what was to come after his lifetime. And it's come. The book division was quite accurate. And what he said about Russia has been very accurate. This is what we're seeing this week in prophecy. I'll put hooks in your jaws and pull you in. Because of its support of Israel's enemies, because of its opposition to the gospel, the judgment of God is coming against Mr. Putin's Russia. Remember, he embodies a kind of neo-Tsarism, a kind of Russian nationalism that is not very pretty. Now, at one time, under Catherine the Great, there was an amicable attitude towards the West because of her romance with the American 
Admiral John Paul Jones, and because of the benevolence she showed the Mennonite refugees who were being persecuted by their faith in Europe, and she opened the doors of Russia to the Mennonites. Unfortunately, this did not last. Likewise, when the Iron Curtain came down, there was this openness to evangelicals and a friendly attitude towards the West. This did not last, and it's partially the fault, to a large degree, the fault of Bill Clinton, who took the side of the Kosovo Liberation Army in the Balkans, which alienated the Russians against America when they'd been sympathetic to America. Nonetheless, this is what we're seeing. Mr. Netanyahu has met with Mr. Putin this week. And upon returning to Israel, he's made another announcement. Rabava was the last Jewish settlement built on the West Bank, and that was in 1991, 25 years ago. The people who were always raging and ranting against the settlements overlooked the fact that no new settlement has been built in 25 years. There's only been expansions of existing ones. This week in prophecy, the illegal settlement not approved by the Israeli government at Amona was evacuated in totality by the Israeli military police authorities. Jewish settlement that was dismantled, it was not legally approved. But Mr. Netanyahu has announced a new one, the first one in 25 years to be established somewhere in Judea. He's not stated where. There's also an expansion underway of the existing Jewish community in Shiloh, Shiloh, the ancient capital of Israel before Jerusalem, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept for 200 years. This is marching on. The prophecies of Zechariah are being fulfilled. Nothing and no one is going to stop it. Satan will try. The Muslim world will try. The Russians will try. The U.S. State Department will try. But they will not succeed. As we read in Zechariah chapter 12, all who lift Jerusalem particularly, those who try to divide it will be hurt grievously. Grievously. This week in prophecy. A new settlement, the first in 25 years in the West Bank, has been announced. Now, there's something peculiar happening. There's a growth of Orthodox Jewish pioneers creating these settlements that are illegal, that are being dismantled by the Israeli government, Amona being the most recent. These Orthodox Jews don't see themselves as Israelis, necessarily. They have a secessionist movement, and they call themselves Judeans. They want to make a splinter state that would be controlled by halakha as its constitution, as a religious body of legislation, rabbinic law, that would be apart from Israel. Now, this is not likely to happen. The Israelis and the Israeli government would not allow this to gain momentum or gain any serious political or legal footage. But it's going to become a divisive issue in retaining the support of religious parties inside Israel to maintain the coalition necessary to govern. And it will force, <clears throat> force the Likud party to make concessions to these settlers. Thus, the establishment of the new settlement announced by Mr. Netanyahu must be seen in that vein. It's something they're being forced to do. This is even after the meeting in Sechi with Mr. Putin. It's not going to stop. Let's continue. The vicar of Baghdad was finally forced to leave. The Anglican, Canon Andrew White, had a price put on his head by ISIS. Lambeth Palace, the Archbishop of Canterbury, ordered him out of Baghdad. He did not want to leave the Middle East or the Middle Eastern Arab community. 
Obviously, he couldn't go to Syria. He couldn't go to Iran. He couldn't go to Saudi Arabia. Where did he go to continue his ministry among Arab Christians? What country in the world would he be safe and his freedom guaranteed to continue his Anglican ministry among Arab Anglicans? Israel. Israel has given him a visa and a home and a right to continue his ministry. I put him up against Hananiah Atik or the former Bishop Kafidi in Jerusalem, or the Sabeel movement, who are anti-Israel. These other Anglicans from St. George's Cathedral in Jerusalem, who are anti-Israel and sympathetic to Islamic Palestinian so-called nationalism, overlook the plight of not only Christians, but specifically other Anglicans in Islamic countries. Again, thank God there's at least one country in the Middle East that will guarantee the safety, guarantee the human rights, and safeguard the religious freedom of Christians and of Arab Christians, and that country is Israel. They're being driven out of everywhere else, especially Syria. Thank God for Israel. Yet we have left-wing clergy, even so-called evangelicals like the Anglican Stephen Sizer condemning Israel. Pretty soon you discover that if you express views critical of Israel, um, you, uh, you, you do arouse uh, criticism and opposition. And, uh, and I think that's why uh, many within the media, the BBC, journalists, mainstream newspapers, um, and politicians are reluctant to uh, be critical of Israel because they know that they will suffer the consequences. Your, your first book about Christian Zionism was uh, the first reference to Christian Zionism. One of the first references, yes. yes. It came out in uh, around 2004. It's been published in Arabic, in Farsi, by IRIB. Uh, and it deals with the historical roots of the movement, uh, its theological agenda, it, you know, it's, it's distinctive uh, beliefs, and then it's political strategy to turn uh, those convictions into reality. So I, I show, for example, how um, th there's a very clear, very simple political strategy. The first is, if you believe that the Jews are God's chosen people, you will, uh, you will support the Jews you will defend Israel, you will target those critical of Israel. So you campaign uh, politically in the White House, the Senate, Congress, Parliament, on behalf of Israel. If you believe that the Jews are God's chosen people and that God gave them the land of the Middle East, then you will support their return. You will fund the return of Jews from Russia, for example, to Israel. If you believe God gave the Jews the West Bank, the Golan, Jordan, then you will encourage the settlement movement. So you have Christian organizations that encourage churches to adopt a settlement, to fund a settlement, a Jewish settlement in the occupied territories. Um, at the moment, the only country in the world that recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is Israel. No other country in the world recognizes Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. There are no embassies in Jerusalem. All the embassies are in Tel Aviv. There is one embassy in Jerusalem, the Christian embassy. And um, so there is a campaign to get the United States to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. How do you do that? You simply move the US embassy to Jerusalem. And if the US moves its embassy to Jerusalem, everyone else will do the same and de facto Jerusalem becomes capital. So there are Christian organizations lobbying Congress to move the embassy to Jerusalem. The, the, the legislation has been passed on at least three occasions. Um, the funding has been allocated, the building has been identified, but three successive presidents have refused to sign the legislation. So it's failed. Um, the uh, Zionist lobby the religious Zionist lobby wants to see the temple rebuilt. The problem is the Haram al-Sharif, the Dome of the Rock, is in the way. 
And so you find Christian groups campaigning with Jewish settlers to destroy the Dome of the Rock in order to rebuild the Jewish temple. So um, in, its, uh, in its extreme form, Christian Zionism is very provocative. It is apocalyptic. It is uh, very fundamentalist in a, in a, in a military sense. Uh, very little different to ISIS or Al-Qaeda in terms of what it's prepared to support. We talked about the ap apocalypse uh, and the fact that the, these events that are happening in the Middle East, um, they also are very much in the same plan as the big Middle East plan with the, the, the Jewish state of Israel as being the dominant power. Um, what do you think is, will be the result of, of the West continuing to support uh, this attitude uh, of, of, of domination in other, other ways in the same region which has already seen the presence of all these, co these countries? Well, in every generation for hundreds if not thousands of years there have been people who held to an apocalyptic theology. Um, so it's not something new that extremism that believes that um, they will bring about God's will through violence or through force uh, is sadly an aberration in all three monotheistic faiths. Um, uh, one of the leading Jewish uh, settlers, uh, Zionists, uh, Gershon Salomon says, um, uh, we must have a war uh, uh, the Messiah will not come by himself, we must bring him by fighting. Now that's the, that's the, that was the position of the zealots in the first century. They believed that as they fought, God would vindicate them. It's not that dissimilar to many of the uh, fundamentalist groups in the Middle East today. They believe God is on their side rather than asking, am I on God's side? Am I following his revealed will in the scriptures or am I using God as an excuse to further my political aims. I mean, my concern is that the Jewish people are going to suffer as a consequence of, uh, if you like, the West perpetuating this uh, conflict in the Middle East. We talk about the two-state solution. America, Europe insists it supports the two-state solution, but we vetoed attempts of uh, the Palestinians to gain recognition in the United Nations. If we believe in the two states, why won't we support the two states? That, that, you know, that inconsistency is perpetuating the violence and I believe ultimately the Jews will suffer the consequence of that. And those that are astute recognize that within Christian Zionism, the Jews are act three in a four act play. They're not there in the end because we've had this great battle of Armageddon and only the followers of Jesus are saved and everyone else is destroyed. You know, if I was Jewish, would I really want those kinds of people supporting me? Because I realize they're using me for their, their theology, not mine. Well, this brings me to your own, uh, your own vision and how your own way of today dealing with these, uh, these uh, actions and the, the suffering that you're going through yourself because of your belief, somehow you also are relating to what you think is right in your, uh, in your, in your manner of, of existence today. Can well, you... I, I go back to the roots of my faith and I go back to the scriptures and recognize that uh, God is not a real estate agent. Uh, God is, uh, he's created this world. Uh, everyone is equal in his sight. We're all created in his image, men and women, all nations. And his will is that we all come to recognize him and obey him, follow him, serve him. And, and, uh, and we express that in the way that we treat others. And we express it particularly in the way that we treat the widows, the orphans, the refugees, the marginalized, the poor. Uh, all through the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, a test of one's holiness, a test of one's faith was how you treated others. And, uh, you know, you can go to the, the prophet uh, uh, Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, not 
believe in justice, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Um, someone who aspires to be a follower of Jesus, he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, turn the other cheek. It's an act of defiance when someone hits you. It's an act of defiance to stay there and refuse to retaliate. It humiliates the, your opponent. Um, if, you're, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. You know, the best way to turn an enemy into a friend is to show compassion for them, to care for them, uh, to, to show that God calls us to a higher ethical standard. Now, that may sound unrealistic, it may sound naive, but it works. Um, let's give you one instance. A week after 9-11, um, I was in Leicester. Uh, it's a, a large uh, Asian immigrant population. Uh, I was hungry. I asked a friend, you know, where could I buy some uh, a takeaway? He recommended somewhere. He said, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a Muslim uh, uh, shop. I went in. Um, no other customers. The guy was, had to cook the food for me in front of me. I was having a conversation with him. I was being polite. I asked him about his family. Um, I think he knew I was a Christian, but um, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. He wrapped my food, I put the money down, he gave me the food and he said, no, I want you to have the food. I said, but I want to pay you. No, I won't take your money. Um, I assume he wouldn't take my money because I was kind to him, because I respected him, because I, I was in his shop. Um, a week later, I was back in the town preaching in a church on the Sunday about the parable of the Good Samaritan, the guy who gets beaten up, left half dead, along come these people and they all ignore him, along comes a stranger and the stranger cares for him. I told them the story, I then told them what happened the week before, and I said, now, I want you all to go to that shop and buy his food, bless him, retaliate, but retaliate with kindness. He showed me kindness, you show him kindness and see what the effect will be. You know, if they, if they all went to that shop and they bought his food, what's going to happen? He's going to tell his friends, you wouldn't believe it. People from the church all came and they wanted to buy my food. You know, that, that creates a cycle of, of, of compassion. When did that happen to you? When, when did you have this, this sudden urge of becoming more compassionate and using uh, your belief and, and, your, and your life to, to, to go towards others? Well, we, we all have a journey. We're all on a journey and there are moments in our lives where our path crosses, if you like, we have an epiphany, an, account, an encounter with God. And uh, as a young man, I was, I was beaten up occasionally at school. I was, not, I was skinny and skinny people tend to get you know, beaten up. And I, but it taught me uh, that, um, you know, there's pain in life. And, but it also taught me to stand up for the person who's being abused. And so there have been occasions in life when I have felt impelled to step into a situation where someone else was suffering. Because I'd suffered, I didn't want them to suffer too. Um, when I got to meet with Palestinians, Christians and Muslims, and saw the way they were being treated, I, uh, I came to a, a realization I wanted to advocate for them, speak for them in the West, and show my love for the Jewish people by showing that we must, uh, we must uh, work for justice for the Palestinians. Because if there is to be peace for the Jews, security for the Jews, there must be justice for the Palestinians. Well, go talk to Canon Andrew White, the vicar of Baghdad. Ask him what he thinks of Israel. This week in prophecy. Rabbi Ma'ir Barhin, chief rabbi of Barcelona, Spain, has gone against much of the orthodox rabbinate and rabbinic communities of Europe. Following the terror attacks in Barcelona, he has formally urged Jews to leave Europe, echoing the warnings given by Benjamin Netanyahu, particularly concerning countries like France. Most rabbis are still opposing him, 
saying it will weaken the Jewish communities in Europe. But Rabbi Meir Bar Hin said there will be no security for the Jewish communities in Europe. They need to leave. They have fled other countries for security. The philosophers from Ethiopia, most of the South African Jewish community has left a number of them to Israel, and now it is France. The history of the Jews in Spain going back to the Inquisition has not always been a happy one. There is a natural fear among Spanish Jews, sometimes derogatorily referred to as Moranos, of Spain, given its history, even though the past injustices were perpetrated largely by the Roman Catholic Church. But now we're beginning to see Orthodox rabbis in Europe telling Jews they need to leave for the sake of their safety. The precedent was set this week in prophecy. I will gather you from the nations where I have scattered you. Thus, we are told. Let's move on. This week in prophecy. Speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, another scandal. Bishop of Phoenix, now retired, Bishop Emeritus Thomas O'Brien. Synonymous with controversy, for more than a decade here in the Valley, embroiled in the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal, even a hit and run arrest. But tonight, new allegations in a lawsuit coming against former Bishop Thomas O'Brien. ABC 15's Mike Pelton digging into the claims and joining us live in Phoenix. And Mike, lay out this case for us. Yeah, well, Steve, this civil lawsuit claims the accuser repressed the memories of the alleged abuse and only recovered those memories decades later. Now, this lawsuit seeks an unspecified amount of money, citing pain, distress, and humiliation for the alleged victim, who is now 47 years old. According to the lawsuit, the accuser remembered repeated sexual abuse that took place at parishes in Phoenix and Goodyear between 1977 and 1982. Now, the plaintiff's attorney tells me his client recovered the memories involving Bishop O'Brien while preparing for his son's baptism. Right now, it is a he said, he said for sure, without a doubt. Now, we're, we have not started discovery yet, and there's lots of evidence out there that remains to be uncovered. So at this point, it's a he said, he said, get back to me in 12 months, and we'll find out if it's still a he said, he said. Now today, the Diocese of Phoenix released a statement that reads in part, quote, Bishop O'Brien was never assigned to any of the parishes or schools identified in the lawsuit, and no specific information has been presented which connects Bishop O'Brien to the plaintiff. Bishop O'Brien categorically denies the allegations. Now remember, this is a civil lawsuit that is still making its way through the court system. We did reach out to Phoenix police today who declined our request for an interview, citing an ongoing investigation. Meanwhile, Bishop O'Brien resigned back in 2003, but he has a storied history here in the Valley. We're going to delve into that coming up tonight at 630. For now, we're live in Phoenix. Mike Pelton, ABC 15, Arizona. Many of us remember that case. Thank you, Mike. Along Admitted his guilt to protecting over 50 Roman Catholic Church priests guilty of pedophilia. People he knew were pedophiles molesting children and of moving them from parish to parish in order to protect them, knowing that they were molesting children in the next parish, the man never went to prison. He left the scene of an accident in which someone was killed. Whether or not DUI allegations are true or not, I don't know, but it is absolutely true. He pled guilty to leaving the scene of a fatal automobile accident as the Archbishop of Phoenix. Well, his day has finally come. Now he's been arrested for sexually abusing little boys himself. The case continues to loom over Roman Catholicism. It's not going to stop. Two weeks ago it was Cardinal Pell. Three weeks ago it was the Vatican's own department responsible for investigating sexual corruption among its clergy were arrested at a homosexual orgy in Rome. There have been a number of fairly strange and disturbing stories coming from the Vatican over the past few months, specifically surrounding Pope Francis and some of the people surrounding him, some of Pope Francis's advisors. George Pell, 
was in a the news earlier this week. Uh, he is being charged over sex offenses. He is the finance chief currently at the Vatican, appointed by Pope Francis, and he has been charged with historical sexual offenses. This happened earlier this week. Uh, he has protested his innocence, saying that he is looking forward to uh, his court date, but there have been rumors surrounding Pell for some time, but that news story uh, just broke earlier this week. Pope Francis has received a large amount of criticism over the uh, preceding months over how he has dealt with previous uh, acts of abuse within the Catholic Church. He recently lowered the punishment of priests that are known to have uh, abused um, children. He lowered their uh, punishment down from defrocking to a lifetime of prayer in some cases, so essentially no punishment at all. So people have criticized Pope Francis, uh, I would say rightly, for not dealing with these sex crimes seriously or appropriately. This news story uh, could potentially have some more links to some of these really strange and disturbing events going on at the Vatican. At least to me, it points uh, out to some of the problem with how uh, the, uh, I guess, the culture of the Vatican and uh, how ineffective they are in, at dealing with these sorts of cases. So this is a very strange story. It's just broken today. Apparently, Vatican police broke up an orgy at the home of one of Pope Francis's advisors. This was at a flat belonging to the Holy Office. And this is, I think, the most disturbing aspect of this story. Uh, the, this flat, which was the home of uh, a secretary to one of Pope Francis's advisors, this property was owned by the Holy Office, uh, reportedly, which is in charge of tax tackling sexual abuse amongst the clergy. So this is a property that's owned by this uh, part of the church that's supposed to be dealing with these, well, with sex abuse crimes. It's not clear whether any actual crimes were committed at this particular um, time, but the fact that this is going on at this location that is, again, owned by um, some uh, organization or part of the church that's looking into uh, sex abuse, the story is bizarre and, and strange enough on its on itself, but that part of it is especially problematic. Um, it, it, to me, points out at least a lack of seriousness, I guess, of the church to um, uh, just on this topic in general. A little bit more from this uh, article reads, the Vatican police have broken up a gay orgy at the home of the secretary to one of Pope Francis's key advisors. It has been claimed uh, the flat belonged to the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or the Holy Office, which is in charge of tackling sexual abuse amongst the clergy. So that is a really strange and, and problematic part of this story. Uh, reports in Italy claim the occupant of the apartment is the secretary to Cardinal Francesco uh, Caccio Palmiero, a key aide to the 80-year-old Pope. Now, he heads the Pontifical Council for the Legislative Texts and was said to have once recommended his secretary for a promotion to bishop. The claims about the police raid last month, these are uh, come from an Italian newspaper and reported in a number of... Uh, Different articles. I have the link to this original article in the description of this video, but it has been uh, re reported in a number of places. Still waiting for more details to come out, uh, but this flat is apparently a short distance from the Vatican. According to the original paper, this raid came after uh, public complaints where neighbors became suspicious before complaint, uh, and they ended up complaining about irregular behavior of those coming and going at the flat. Police were then forced to show up. They reportedly found drugs and a group of men engaged in sexual activity. 
so there uh, it seems is some sort of uh, there will be some uh, i imagine criminal uh, investigation with the drugs being found it's not clear whether there were any any minors that's not being reported uh, in regards to the sexual activity that was taking uh, place there but it is the latest scandal to hit the vatican and this again comes after uh, months of criticism of Pope Francis and this fairly uh, big breaking story with George Pell, who is, uh, as far as I know, the third ranking member of the uh, Vatican. He's essentially the third most uh, powerful individual in the in the hierarchy of the Vatican. Uh, he is now facing these historical sexual abuse. Pell has said that he's innocent. This does come after uh, years of uh, accusations against Pell. Police have not revealed details of the charges against the 76-year-old, citing the need to preserve the integrity of the judicial process. Pell appointed to clean up the Vatican's murky finances. He has taken a leave of absence to defend himself against the sex abuse charges in Australia. In March, the Vatican was hit with a wave of lurid accusations of misbehaving priests across Italy with scandals involving orgies, prostitution, and porn videos. The claims were embarrassing to the Vatican, which under Pope Francis has attempted to demand high standards of the clergy. Uh, Francis had tried to clamp down on unethical behavior ever since being made Pope in 2013 and has spoken out against the pitfalls of temptation. That's according to this article. Um, again, he has taken a number of steps. Pope Francis has been criticized by victims of uh, sexual abuse by uh, on how he's uh, dealt with and many people would say uh, set back the, uh, the road to justice for many of these uh, victims with lowering penalties against known um, priests and uh, among uh, other policies that uh, many people have been rightfully critical of. Um, but this is a very strange story. It might tie in with some of these other uh, ongoing investigations, some of these other cases that are finally being looked into. Uh, I, I imagine a number of people are involved and with the um, drugs being rec recovered from this property. I do. I hope. I imagine uh, there will be more details to come out on this. There's no end to it. It's going to continue. More and more people born into Roman Catholicism are not practicing it. More and more people are defying the church's teaching. The incident that took place in the media with Sean Hannity when he was attacked by Roman Catholic priests as a heretic because Sean Hannity said he thinks birth control for married couples is not wrong. Just shows essentially what's happening. How can a church that does this, whose hierarchy systematically conspires on an international scale to orchestrate a protection racket for dangerous sex criminals, have any moral authority to dictate or even provide guidance to other people concerning issues of sexual morality or marital sanctity. When you have a pope like the present one, who doesn't seem to have Romans chapter 1 in his New Testament or in his Latin Vulgate, saying, if two men are in a same-sex relationship, who am I to judge? That's very inspecific. When Jesus spoke, he did not speak as the Pharisees. He spoke as one with authority, we're told in John 5. He appealed not to the letter of the law, but to the spirit. This is right and this is wrong. And so with Pope Francis, as he calls himself, who again refused to meet with the families of the victims of pedophilia when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, where I'm going next week, he says, who is he to judge? So the homosexuals in the Catholic Church and the homosexual priests and lesbian nuns in the Catholic Church are saying, 
oh, the Pope changed the position on homosexuality and lesbianism. We can be that. While the conservatives who will defend the papacy and the Roman church no matter what are saying, no, he only changed the emphasis. He didn't change the official position. In other words, he was speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He did not speak as one with authority. The Roman Catholic Church only has moral credibility in the mind of a willfully blind idiot. You must be a willfully blind idiot to attribute any moral credibility to the papacy. Please quote me. If there's a priest who wants to debate me on TV, I'll debate him, providing he is a ordained Roman Catholic priest. Let's continue. This week in Prophecy, the Israeli Ministry of Finance said that Israel could potentially generate $4 billion annually of new revenue from the production of high-grade medical marijuana. This is quite a situation. They can control tetrahydrocannabinol content percentage-wise, again, only for clinical issuance. The question of medical marijuana is debated. While there is evidence that it will help glaucoma patients to reduce interocular pressure, there is no evidence that it works better than other things or that non-intoxicating amounts can be prescribed without those side effects that impair driving ability, distance perception, short-term memory, and the upset of hormonal balances in human metabolism, particularly males. But there's money to be made. Israel is the most agrotechnic society outside of the United States. It is advanced beyond the countries in Europe generally. When drought destroyed the tulip crop in Holland, the Israelis grew the tulips for the Dutch, germinating them in greenhouses and irrigating them with a drop system. They're quite good at all kinds of things to do with agricultural technology, from de-desertification to biogenetic engineering of seeds. And now they're beginning to move into medical marijuana. My question is, will this relate to the prophecy in the book of Revelation concerning pharmakia, a term for witchcraft in the occult that actually means chemical hallucinogens? But that is this week in prophecy. President Trump has again jumped to Israel's support. He forced the United Nations not to blacklist companies doing business with Israel because they are involved in trading with companies or in partnership with companies that are on the West Bank. He took that action. May God bless him and may God bless America because of what he did. Nonetheless, he has enemies, not the least of which are even within his own State Department and certainly within his National Security Council, as we've warned with Mr. McMaster's and the Rhinocrats. Those Democrats who sit on the opposite side of the aisle, the Democrats in the Republican Party, Senators Murkowski, Senators Collins, Susan Collins, Senator John McCain, Senator Jeff Flake from uh, Arizona, and now Senator Corker from Tennessee, questioning the mental stability of President Trump with no clinical evidence for doing so. None. Remember, President Trump, to become president, did not have to defeat the Democrats alone. He had to defeat the Republican Party establishment led by the Bushes. He does not have a majority in the Senate. People like Mr. Ryan, who wants to increase the $20 trillion deficit, and people like Mitch McConnell, who doesn't want the swamp drained, cannot be relied on. They are not conservatives. 
they are sometimes called rhinos, Republican in name only. I don't know if I would put it that way. I've always said the Republican Party as a whole is as bad as the Democrat Party, even though there are more authentic conservatives and libertarians within it. Mr. Trump's biggest enemies are not simply the left. His biggest enemies are the Democrats and the Republican Party, the Rhinocrats. We again urge people to pray for President Trump. Pray for the forthcoming elections and pray that Rhinocrats are removed from Congress and from office. Mr. Trump would like to do more things that are friendly to Israel, that are friendly to the interests of Christians, that are pro-life, and that I think would be in the general interest of the national economy. But the swamp rats like the swamp, they have a vested interest. People like McCain and Collins and Flake, these people who continually oppose their own president, the leader of their own party, have created a situation where, although the Republicans ostensibly had a majority in the Senate and in the House and controlled the White House, they're not able to do anything because of the swamp rats, the rhinocrats, the Susan Collins types, the Jeff Flake types. Again, we need to pray for Mr. Trump. There is a spiritual battle. I'm not arguing for political ideology or parties. I don't believe in that. But I do believe we need to pray for those who are in authority, that they'll do the best thing for the country, and so that we as Christians can lead peaceable lives. It is indeed quite a situation. And it's continuing. He's not just up against the left. He's up against the Rhinocrats in his own party. Finally, Janet Yeltsin's days may be numbered. Some people like her as a Fed chairman, some do not. Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I avoid those things, but the fact of the matter is that the U.S. dollar has lost 96% of its purchasing power since the Federal Reserve was established in 1913. In June 2015, the Federal Reserve announced that it would not be raising interest rates because the U.S. economy couldn't handle the change. They also lowered their expectations for the coming year in terms of economic growth. But what does any of that mean? What is the Federal Reserve and how do they affect the economy? Okay, so. The Federal Reserve, or the Fed, is the U.S.'s central bank. This means that they oversee all American banks and are the only ones allowed to issue U.S. currency. Essentially, they regulate the American economy, and that means they wield a lot of power and responsibility. One of their most significant roles is changing interest rates in order to keep the U.S. economy in check. The way it works is like this. The Fed is what lends money to all U.S. banks at a certain interest rate. Whatever interest rate they charge is going to correspond with the interest rate your bank charges you. When interest rates are low, people borrow more and then spend more. This stimulates the economy. Following the 2007 financial crash, the Fed dropped rates to nearly zero in the hopes that it would encourage people to spend. On the other hand, when the economy is strong, people spend more, causing inflation. If the rate of inflation gets too high, then prices skyrocket and the economy crashes. So when things are going a little too well, the Fed raises those interest rates to keep everything on track. It is by raising and lowering interest rates that the Fed tries to balance America's financial situation. The Fed was originally created in 1913 as a response to the panic of 1907. At the time, private banks across the country were running out of money. In order to stop the market from crashing, banker J.P. Morgan took control of the banking industry and got stronger banks to help out failing banks. Basically, the Fed was created to similarly regulate and direct banks and to be able to inject money into the economy when necessary. But with so much responsibility, the Fed has been pointed to as a major factor in both the 1933 Great Depression and the 2007 recession. In terms of the recent housing bubble, they were blamed for keeping interest rates low after a minor 2001 recession. This led to low interest borrowing across the country and was one of the reasons people borrowed money for houses they couldn't afford. 
The Fed is also directly responsible for a period of extreme inflation and high unemployment during the 1970s caused by the overprinting of money. They've also been criticized for a lack of transparency in their operations. The Federal Reserve has been a common topic of contention for politicians and those unhappy with the current U.S. economy. Whether or not it should be government controlled or even exist at all are difficult questions to answer. At the very least, it's important to consider the relevant effect they have on keeping America's economy at a steady rate of growth. There are those who do not like the United States, including Mr. Putin and China, who would like to undermine the dollar as the world currency reserve. It's a precarious situation. And as Mr. Ryan and other people are intent on destroying the dollar, and as we have a Fed that is as corrupt as the day is long that needs to be audited, then abolished, it's also important that Christians do not forget to pray. For other things that go beyond the presidency and Congress. The power of the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, where you have unconstitutional judges who are enemies of the Constitution, legislating from the bench, men who should be impeached and women who should be impeached and removed, even up to the level of the Supreme Court, you have an unconstitutional court system now. And you have the Federal Reserve System which is a fourth branch of government that's completely unelected and uncontrollable. The same as these judges are unelected and uncontrollable. We desperately need judicial reform and an abol abolition of the Federal Reserve System. What does this have to do with prophecy? Read Revelation chapter 13. A one world currency will not be a friend to anybody except ultimately the powers of Antichrist. I was disturbed to learn that certain airlines are going to begin to use an ID system with subcutaneous implantation of chips as a security pass. That's already been experimented with by British Rail beginning last month. These technologies are indeed converging. The signs of ever more on the horizon. My biggest problem with the blood moon nonsense of Mark Biltz and of the, of the September 23rd nonsense of the Virgo and even of the eclipse on Tisha B'Av is this. As I've said repeatedly, people become focused on that or they become focused on conspiracy theories with the Illuminati but they take their eyes off of this. In the process, they get diverted from looking at the things scripture tells us to focus on. Well, that has been This Week in Prophecy. Coming to you from my native and beloved New York City, this is James Jacob Prash. Lord willing, see you next week. I shall be in Argentina. God bless. Bye.